subject to non-greenhouse season extension strategies. And the speaker is David Greenberg, Red Fox Farm in Center Burlington, which is about an hour north of uh, Alamex. And David Greenberg raises salad greens <coughs> for wholesale markets in Halifax, including Teats for Teats and homegrown organic foods. And he is particularly interested in developing systems that make small farms more profitable, efficient, and fun. So I'm sure we're going to have a fun time. Let's take a David stop. Hello, everybody. Uh, so uh, I thought the way I'd structure this talk is just go through a PowerPoint very quickly just to get a visual of some of the things I'm talking about. And then uh, hopefully we'll have a fruitful discussion. I find often in these talks, if the speaker just goes on and on, it kind of gets you know, kind of half to sleep. But then there's like nuggets of information that come out. And then often at the end of the talk, when people start kind of sharing what they know, like you get like all the content of the talk in like the last five minutes and it's over, you kind of frustrated. So my aim is to get to that point where the nuggets come out quickly and uh, not indulge in that level of feeling of having a lot of people pay attention to me as I draw on the line, which somehow human psychology just requires that most of us love that. So I'm going to do my best to bring in that indulgence. Um, the uh, topic of my talk is non-greenhouse season extension. And the first slide, obviously, I will just convince myself. Is it to the right? Okay. Second. Um, the first slide, this is a greenhouse design, an uh, experimental greenhouse design. It's a hybrid between the caterpillar tunnel that Johnny's is selling the vendor for and showing plans for on their website, crossed with the uh, Hanley Coop House that Todd Hanley from Oklahoma has designed. And I'm trying to kind of combine the best of those two designs to have a sturdy group house that costs around 50 cents a square foot and is very, very easy to put up and take down to do. So it's sort of like cheap, durable, and more mobile than an Ellie Coleman style tow green house. And I'll put it up one day and the next day. It's dry. <laughs> Just a few critical design features. <laughs> um, unfortunately, anyone who's tried to do season extension with the festival, this is not an uncommon event. Um, I, I was talking to someone who was a grower in her friends for many years who was telling me she was, uh, she had a, her tray of tomato seedlings in her greenhouse in the spring and it had been very wet and it was windy. And she kind of heard this shaking sound her 100 foot greenhouse with propane heaters and overhead, you know, all this and everything just lifted right up. And she just felt this breeze and wasn't sure what happened. And she just watched the whole greenhouse lift right up over her and fall right down on her other greenhouse. Just came to the one shot. I've had greenhouse disasters that have literally made me cry in anguish and fear for how I'm going to get here. And, uh, Many very confident and smart people are some of the leading growers here who have had similar experiences. So um, greenhouses are great, and I'm still obviously working at it. But at some point, I figured out I really better <coughs> I better figure out how to extend my season, not only because I don't want to just do regular field crop growing and greenhouses, but I want to get all those things. So I sort of, this is one of the rare sunny days this spring. <laughs> Here I am making raised beds that I'm about to do some experiments with. Um, for some of the people here in the room who have been farming for a while, do you ever know when you're growing a crop that's been selling great at farmers market? People love it in your CSA, so however it is, it's just marketing wonderfully well. It's germinating well, it's growing well, you got the weed control on the roof really well. How exciting that is. And then if you're a new grower, maybe you're fantasizing that that's what you're supposed to do. I remember when I first started farming, I was like, there's 43,000 square feet in an acre. So that means if I just was to 
harvest one head of lettuce per square foot, two dollars, so that'd be thirty-six thousand dollars. <laughs> minus, let's just say a third for paths, and I'll take off ten percent for whatever. I mean, I've got a living, and of course, I'm not only going to grow lettuce, but I'll grow lettuce and chard and kale and arugula and tomatoes. And I think it should be very easy to grow forty thousand dollars of produce on an acre of land. Like this is so great. Why don't more people do this? <laughs> you know, ten years later, I kind of had my answer. But, uh, <laughs> but those rare moments where I had had that feeling, and it's such a wonderful feeling of optimism and joy when you have crops coming off your land one after another, and you bring them to farmers market. I find this particularly true about a farmers market. People love. Your CSA basket, it's like, they're just like, great basket day, see you next week. I, I find that that rush where if you go to farmer's market and you see all the customers coming to the Lord's table and you're like, give me that, I don't care when it's trapped, that's exactly what I want, you sold me last week, I want twice as much this week. You're like, yeah, that's <laughs> fun. And so for a harvest day where you're leading up to that experience, it's fun, it's rewarding, it's easy to get up in the morning to harvest crops and you're going to sell them. And I found that those crops were produced earlier or later, or had an exceptionally high quality of greenhouse tomatoes, were almost always the crops that did that. So, um, so that's why I'm just so jazzed about God greenhouse. Uh, another another thing I believe they say there's only one rule in economics that's not obvious, and it's something like. If someone can do something more valuable than the thing they're doing, it's not profitable. So it's not profitable for a brain surgeon who works as a taxi driver because they have something more useful to do for society that pays more. So even if they're making money as a taxi driver, they're poor. Yeah. So if you can grow a crop with row cover that costs a fraction of the cost it takes to do it in the greenhouse, you are not making as much money to grow that greenhouse. So like a classic example is I've seen people who've gone with zombies trying to grow mustard greens in summer because of flea beetles. And they discover that flea beetles don't really like to hunt and dry. So they grow their mustard greens in a greenhouse in the summer. And I, I know people who do this. They just control the flea beetles. So like, man, A, the mustard greens don't like to eat. And B, you could be growing really profitable tomatoes in the greenhouse instead of wasting your summer greenhouse space. On flea beetle control, man, you just have to learn that you throw things out. So that's the kind of thought that you have to use what greenhouse space didn't blow down to its highest, <coughs> most profitable use. Because it will blow down, so you want to make as much money out of it before that happens. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one thing. So here I am. I, uh, it was a wet spring this year in my part of the world. I think it was probably a wet spring in everyone's part of the world that's here. Um, I had land here that uh, was south facing and well drained. And I was able to plow it and run it till and it was in pretty good shape. And then the rain came, the rain came, the rain came. And I wanted to just say something about uh, one of the first principles of non garden, non greenhouse season extension that I always think about is getting your field work done on time. And then you kind of have to have like a no excuses. So I'm on a pretty heavy soil series, it's called a Hannaford Low. And it's it's not exactly like uh, sandy soil. It's not pure clay, it's somewhere in between, you say. We're on the same soil series, we're like Hannaford. Uh, Rupert's just a kind of soil series. I think we have very similar soil. Yeah, quite. So um, it's not freely draining soil. Um, so, I kind of just took a, like, I've got to get these crops in the ground attitude this spring. And so what I did is, and this is a season section, I had machines to work with, so I could have done whatever, but instead of waiting, I went out there in the rain with the shovel, laid out string lines, and tried to dig. And of course, the soil just immediately fell to my shovel. I can't do this. And I was not happy to do this, no excuse. So I took a big rock. It was just big enough for me to kick forward and then take a shovel full 
modern technology happens. Anyway. Um, okay. So now you're going to have to be my dancer. It's funny, I've been watching people sit at the podium like all conference. Anyway, back on track. Um, so, yeah, so landscape fabric has proved to be wonderful. And now I will answer your question about that and down. Part, before I knew there was going to be this terrible wet spring, I decided to do the raised beds for landscape fabric in order to get the landscape fabric on really tight. And the idea is that if you stretch something, a sheet, tight on flat ground, you can't really get it so that you can take out your slack, unless that sheet is stretchy. And that's why um, plastic film that you use, a plastic mulch, they always, like when you see a mechanical plastic mulch layer, there's always some guide wheel or something that's going to pull it tight, slam it into the ground into furrows, and you know, draw the soil over it so that it's stretched tight, and then if you get temperature fluctuations or whatever, it will still be tight. Uh, loose equals flapping, flapping equals blown away. So what I did here, now I'm just going to go off mic a little bit just so I can point. I would, uh, I'll just talk real loud. I uh, have 12 foot wide pieces of fabric and I measured out my beds so that there were 11 feet on center for every two beds. So I would pin it down here, pin it down here, then again, and I pin it down with landscape fabric pins that were uh, either eight or six inches. I experimented with two lengths, pinning them down like a tent peg. And then I would walk on the row in between, and I had to just get it so that it was loose enough that the fabric could get down the middle row, but tight enough that I was stretching and just pulling that landscape fabric tight into the bed. And I chose this picture because you can actually see how there's like all these stretch marks. You know, it's like, you can see it's like really reefed up. That is tight. Like it's so tight that you can see like the holes in the fabric are like almost deformed. So then I'd get it tight, I'd be on my hands and knees like this, going out the row, and I'd have a rock and the pins and I'd pick one that way, pick one that way, this way, this way. And that was that. To get any, and you know, that was the final ab cluster exercise for the spring. Uh, so then about every 18 inches I had a pin uh, opposite each other so that and if the wind was pulling it this way, there was a pin holding it here. If the wind was pulling it that way, there was a pin holding it there. And I didn't, it didn't budge. And this is on top of a hill with a big tidal estuary where lots of wind comes through. And uh, once I got the fabric tight like that, it did not blow. And I used uh, a pin about every 18 inches along the edge and a pin every 18 inches in the middle. And a nice thing and with the total overlap like that, you put your sheet number one down, pin it hard on one side, barely pin it on the, on the next one, and then I'd overlap the next piece. So I'd do like a pin every 15 feet just to hold it. And I'd put another piece down and pin it every 18 inches through both layers. So I was effectively cutting my pinning labor down that way. Okay. We'll leave it at that. Um, you know, pinning, you really have to get it right. It has to be tight, it has to be close together. Yes? Uh, what did you use for pins? I used, uh, they're called sod staples. Uh, they're used to keep sod in place. They're pretty much the standard unit for holding landscape fabric down. And uh, I found a supplier in the States that is the largest manufacturer of sod staples. And I kind of became friends with the sales manager. And he wants me to be the sales manager in Canada, actually. And um, if people are interested in getting it, I'm looking to do a real big bulk order of the pins and the fabric. And uh, about 50% of the cost that you can get in Canada shipped directly out from the States. Um, he's, the largest, he's the largest distributor of this black plastic. It's uh, put underneath every new road that's built, and they bring in 350 containers of it a year. That's big shipping containers, and uh, that's a lot. Yes? We've got ours from Armtech because it's really handy to us. 
Um, do you know a boat? I think ours was for a, three, for a 12 foot wide, 360 foot roll. It was about four hundred dollars. Right, and I could get it for one hundred seventy-five. Is that right? And I think you said yours is non-woven by Berkeley. It's uh, non-woven. Yeah. So this stuff should last about twenty to thirty years. Really? Yeah. There's an article in the current issue of Growing for Market where a wonderful uh, flower producer in Washington State is doing half an acre of this outside, and she inherited some from a farmer who retired, and it's twenty plus years old, and it's showing no signs of wear. The cool thing about it is in plastics, you just dye jet black and it's that high quality, it just does not break down in the UV. But it's really slow. Yeah. So using it year after year, you just take all the pins up, roll it out, and when you roll it out the next year, you just have to line it up perfectly so all the holes are yes. again. Uh, so I'll, could, could, like, conceivably, could you just leave it there over the winter? Yes. And this is another form of we were talking about uh, getting your field work done at all costs is like the prime non greenhouse season extension technique. Now, this year, I find myself like, I'm just going to, yes, I'm just going to go through a few more slides and we'll have a whole discussion. We'll talk about some of those things, like, in the discussion. I'm just see. Okay, here. I mean, I'm just going to show some meat control here. And also earliness. These were really early. I don't have a date on them, but they were way, way ahead of anything I've done before now. There's a big control, one more. Ah, that's pretty much unbeated on this. Um, I had one guy spend maybe 20 minutes on like four or five hundred pounds of items. He was just like a guy from the city who's never worked on a farm. He was like kind of plucking away at the odd uh, uh, vetch. I had a lot of this was like a pasture. November before, just plowed in November of 10, and this is the spring of 11. And it was just a solid batch, which would be like a weed nightmare. And there's basically no weeds, because once the onion gets shy and shaped out that little hole, the weeds are dead. So I heard kind of story about this, and he said, So that would be like walk away onions, man. Yeah, walk away onions, plant them and walk away. Yeah, now we're talking. Um, yeah, let's just move through the slides. This, uh, this is super early lettuce, where I just, just for fun, just wanted to see what the lettuce would do. I also grew lettuce on the fabric in the middle of the summer. We didn't really get a good heat challenge. I was curious how the lettuce would do with the extra soil heat, but with really even moisture. And I did, in fact, grow a pen lettuce in the middle of the summer, unirrigated, which really doesn't mean much this summer. Hopefully, if we have. Um, you know, a, a more hot, dry summer would be really interesting to see what a black plastic or with a really nice moisture does. You basically don't have to water under landscape fiber in Nova Scotia. I mean, even if it did rain for two months at a time, there's just so much soil moisture and it just does not evaporate with that cover. Uh, here's super early kale. Uh, the kale is like, it seems to be like two weeks ahead of what it would be in bare soil. Um, it's a bit. There's my friend Robert planting corn and next spot side, the other corn is grown. This is a little test garden we did. It's like a home garden in front of the house. We grew corn, basil, eggplants, tomatoes, and peppers in front of the little coop house. And um, here we have something interesting. So growing tomatoes, obviously a very profitable crop. Um, everyone likes tomatoes. I really do think that if there's ever a crop that justifies having a coop house, it's tomatoes. Uh, the crop quality is so high, but uh, you know, I don't have a boot press right now. That doesn't blow away. So uh, I thought I would just have some fun. So I grew pretty early seedlings, planted them in early May. And again, I don't have a date, but you can kind of see by the crops behind how like, early it is. And this, this is like really early. And those hoop houses, those hoops are two and a half feet tall. Um, Dubois Agri Innovation is here. I'm not going to kick back on them. But they have some fabulous products. They're a really top quality company from Quebec that sell uh, anything that you use that's plastic for farming. And they also sell these spring seal hoops, which are kind of expensive. They were like delivered to Scotia Gold in the valley. They're like 115 bucks for 88 of them. But you spread them like three or four feet apart 
they last, they're great. Um, I just poke them into the landscape fiber, whip them around, gem and grab the other end, smash it in the ground, and we just like walk down the road, we could like poop up a hundred foot road in five minutes, and then we put row cover on it, and uh, I'm going to show you just the way I attach the row cover. Uh, also, here's our little test garden where we have uh, the tomatoes do well, because it's a little bit slow. That's, uh, I'm covering them about July 1st. They're about three feet tall. The stems are like that thick. They're beginning to form fruit. It's July 1st. Other people have two week old seedlings like this big. And we got them last two years. And this is so we'll have an area I'm harvesting a beautiful crop of sundolls this back. Here I'm harvesting beautiful sundolls in this crappy year. We had tons of tomatoes this year. And, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, like, we actually, it was interesting to see how, um, where we really pruned well, we got a lot less light, but we got whaled with, uh, I think down in mildew um, in mid-September, the worst I've ever seen. But you, when you went, you got until September without the light. Perfect, beautiful. I do think the landscape fiber is a great sanitizing help. But then would you consider, like, did you, I don't know, I know other Yeah, I'm sure that would help. I'm just not, not that focused. I, I, I'm, I'm just, I have a sprayer, I never use it. I should, probably. Yeah. It's not what I'm into. Yeah, I was, I've never used it before, I was curious about it. Let's just work through these. Um, this is just showing up some early salad greens. Okay, this is what I really want to show, yes. Just, just row cover, no, no hoops. No, but um, you, you're not using the uh, uh, No, it's only for transplanted crops. Um, yeah. You can do some cool things with like landscape yeah. fabric. I haven't, I'm going to talk about that next year if you invite me back. Um, there's some really cool things you can do with plastic and direct seeded crops that I'm learning from Michael Walter, who's a genius of a farmer on the South Shore. He's just an amazing man. And they wanted to do really great things. And uh, Michael lost his right leg, I believe, in a fishing accident as a young man, and has uh, done some really cool things to make farming efficient so he doesn't have to bend over. And he grows salad mix where he smothers out each crop with black plastic and then uncovers it and direct seeds. And keeps doing this like three, three times in a season and has very awesome weed control. Um, I'm trying to replicate what he does, taking out some of the sort of processes that he has that don't seem to work that well, that he himself is frustrated with. But the basic idea is amazing. Yes? Can you use that fabric to see what yet? You, you need some bamboo that you want to cut in little pieces. You just cut a slit, pull it apart a little bit with the bamboo, put it in your seeds. When the thing comes up, take out the bamboo and don't use it all. Cool, have you done that? Yes. Awesome. There you go. I, I, I'm really looking forward to getting through these slides. Just give me an idea, and then we can like get all our nuggets out. So, just this one little thing that I invented this year. Uh, that's just a piece of rubber from an um, inner tube. I just took my solid staple, hammered it through a piece of inner tube. And now I have a nice little gasket that will prevent the lid out of the Row cover from ripping out um, from the landscape fabric, but from the, it's from the row cover from ripping through the pin. Um, and I found rigid plastic worked better, and I have some rigid plastic in the junkyard that worked even better than that. It was just, you can buy, you know, repins at Johnny's, they're great. I, I bought a box years ago. They're just expensive. They're like, I don't know, 30 cents each or something, and these are like 5 cents each, so 10 cents each, so. You got it. It's nice to be able to hold your plastic down without rocks. Um, I found, I just intuited that rocks wouldn't really work so well with the hoops and the slippery plastic. So here again, I'm using my pins to hold the, um, the roll cover down over the hoops. And I had it on top of the windy pill and had no problem. It worked. Okay. And this is my last slide. Um, one other thing about season extension 
is being able to grow crops that let you cool and wet in the middle of the summer. Again, this year was not much of a trick. Um, a big part of my marketing is selling spinach to Pizza Boutique. That's supposed to be about 80% of my income, 50% uh, of my web. A lot of it. And I invested in mini wobblers, which I first found out about from Elliot Coleman. You know, more and more people are using them. They were first invented in Florida to keep uh, frost off of strawberry blossoms. They're extremely efficient. The set I have is 100 feet long. It throws 20 feet wide and uses not a lot of water. It's um, attached with three quarter inch poly pipe. It's fairly inexpensive. It's fairly good against wind. And it's awesome for germinating direct seeded crops. You can just like, flick it on. It puts on half an inch an hour, so you know, 10 minutes. And you just completely wet this 20 by 100 foot strip very accurately. It's actually beautiful. It's quiet. Um, pretty clog resistant. I irrigated. Um, I used clod water and it didn't clog up much, just a little bit. And, um, just, I really think with climate and a little wonky, uh, you know, providing heat and moisture is really cool. So, uh, what did you say those were called? Mini wobblers from Senegar <laughs> Irrigation. Um, Senegar. Um, if you Google mini wobbler, or if you YouTube mini wobbler, there is a YouTube video of like, this sprinkler is working. You know your garden geek when it's like one in the morning and you can't see and you're on YouTube watching the videos and sprinklers working. And it's passing and you're like, I can't go to sleep yet. Oh, look at that spray pattern. And you're like, oh man. This is bad. But I love it. I'm among my people. You all understand. I'm excited. Wow, look at that spray pattern here. Um, I was like so excited when I got this. Um, yes? Yeah, how about the cost of it? I, I, I was afraid someone was going to ask that. It wasn't that much. I got 300 lineal feet of it, and it was a little bit more than 300 bucks. And then I had to buy just a few extra things, and that didn't include the poly pipe, which is cheap. I used really low grade poly pipe. Um, I'm going to say it was about 500 bucks for 300 lineal feet. And if you think that $500, 300 feet, 20 feet wide, your per square foot cost is well under a dime. So, like I was selling beautiful, you know, bunches of spinach, you know, 12 ounce bunches of spinach in the middle of the summer. And I feel like we do that in a drop year with this stuff. So you're looking at like one bed, four or 500 feet long, could easily be four or 500 bucks. So, you know, you, sell arugula, you know, how valuable arugula is when no one else has it. Um, so, you know, if you're the person at farmer's market, if you're the one who's CSA has a tender, juicy arugula, and people love arugula, this is, that's your competitive advantage right there. Yes? Going to landscape, is that Yes. The, the state has been kind of evolving. They, I remember like way back in the day, like in the mid-90s, they really didn't want plastic down over the winter because they felt it would kind of hinder soil life. The beautiful thing about the landscape fabric is it's very permeable to air. And when you pull off landscape fabric, it's really cool to see. It's just solid work caskets underneath. Like I did an experiment where I put landscape fabric down just on untilled sod that's been there forever. And, in the, and I put it down in the fall, lifted it up in the spring, and there's like a half inch layer of worm caskets. Beautiful. It's all the slide deck. No. Um, <laughs> something that I also learned about landscape fabric is that grass grows underneath it in a single layer. Almost dies, but doesn't quite. So I had landscape fabric down for a long time. I looked underneath. It seemed like week by week the grass was getting more and more feeble and light colored. Take the landscape fabric off, a week later, <laughs> right back to beautiful green grass. A double layer kills it. So I had all this nasty uh, vetch, and I had a lot of landscape fabric. So I did a lot of double layers of landscape fabric, where I put the first layer down, pin it every 15 feet, put the second layer down, pin it every 18 inches, let that sit for like a month or two, 
peel it back, and it actually was all just like white, you know, give me sunlight growth, you know, just all over the place. Grow it till that, and plant it really hard to do things like salad mix with not much of a problem. Uh, slug populations explode under landscape fiber. I would find when you lived under a landscape fiber for a good run for a while, there was lots of slugs and also tons of snakes. Snakes, you love it under there. If you're snakeophobic, watch out. <laughs> it was like, you know, 10 or 15 snakes under one sheet. And they're just eating the slugs, I'm sure, or whatever else. Yes? Did the slugs eat the crops that you're transferring through it? They didn't, as far as I can tell. Um, I don't know. I had a lot of organic matter rotting. I don't know. I, I, I did it that areas where I mulched down the grass. I, uh, that experiment turned into a no-till potato experiment or minimal till where I mulched out 300 by 12 foot strip, just scuffed it up with a tiller, planted 150 pounds of sweet potatoes just on the surface, and mulched it with mulch hay. But I had major slug damage like slug or ramma. But I've also had slug or ramma with any kind of hay mulching, so who knows what. But it was like unbelievable. I also did a strip like that with kale, where I left, where I didn't mulch, and it was the worst slug damage on kale I ever had. And this is a wet crap year, so you know, you'd have to replicate that a few times to really decide. Um, yes. Can you explain whether or not you remove the mulch yes. in the fall and how you're dealing with fertility? Okay, so this is an exciting thing. That's, this is kind of getting to the crux of some really cool steps forward, I think, for this small-scale season extension. And this is the first year I've done it, so it's a little premature. Um, I've taken up some of the landscape fabric. You know, you think in one way you put it down, take it off at the end of the year, you know, maybe take it off early to do a cover crop, take it off so you can top dress and compost in the spring. You know, there's all those kind of classic regimes you do. And at that point, you know, you're kind of integrating the landscape fiber with fertility in a sort of conventional, conventional, but traditional organic approach. Um, I'm also doing some things like I had some beds of uh, tomatoes. So the tomatoes I have, you know, single row of holes down the bed. And I'm thinking of just leaving those be, maybe throwing some sort of, you know, crab meal or chicken, nasty industrial chicken. Dry stuff or compost tea or whatever you want to use, but leaving it down and planting something that needs an early start or or not even. Maybe I'll just you know go to squash the next year. You know, do something like uh, you know, take it down the trellis and clean up the tomato residue pretty much. Now I have this waste bed, it's covered, it's totally happy, it's not gonna roll over the winter, and I can plant zucchinis. Transplant zucchini in May and put one of those tunnels over it and wait for early zucchini. <coughs> you know, and I'm very curious about that. I have beds that have the onions, so now I have holes, you know, 12 inch spacing, and I can plant super early uh, lettuce or fennel or something like that. Um, yes? I've just been thinking since you've been talking, would it be worth trying or is it plausible? What, what are the problems going to be if you? Did your soil amendments the preceding year? You grew a really nice crop of say field peas in winter rye. You bed form that in November, put on your fabric in November, and then you could no-till right into the top of it. And that's, yeah, that's exactly. Oats, with, oats might be better because you would have the rye coming through the hole. Uh, that's exactly the kind of line of thinking I'm going on this and. It's a lot of labor to um, to put the fabric down. It's not insignificant. So I think that landscape fabric is probably limited either to really small micro-scale growers who don't want to justify some sort of cultivation equipment or just certain high-value crops. If you kind of look around at websites of really awesome organic farms, you're seeing more and more landscape fabric and tomatoes. That seems to be like a golden combination. And, um, like the inventor of the cool bot, um, Pug Farm, Huguenot Street Farm, down in uh, New York. They're like Uber farmers, like super awesome, amazingly brilliant farmers. Who, he also invented an electric electric G conversion. So it's now trying to see running on car batteries. He's uh, charging the solar panel. They're like just brilliant farmers. And so they have all this really great cultivation here. 
And if you look at his website, you'll see that all his tomatoes are on Insta Fiber. You know, and I find trellised outdoor tomatoes or trellised greenhouse tomatoes are particularly difficult to keep weed free. And we had zero weeding our tomatoes and there was no weeds. They didn't lose their shoes off. No weeds. No Great tomatoes. <laughs> so, um, you know, yes. Did you have much uh, wire wool? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's a whole topic. Discussion. I got my butt kicked by uh, sort of large, nasty things in the soil this year. I had terrible wireworm, really terrible June bug grub damage. Terrible. Sorry. Um, Stuart asked if I had bad wireworm this year. Uh, I did. Yes. This is why we leave time for questions. Um, there's two ways you can do this. Well, there's three ways. One way is you can take a razor knife and cut an X or an L or a T. And then you're going to get a little frame, but I found not actually that much. And for tomatoes, I like that. So I found the most efficient thing was a slice and a slice. And you just kind of have to hold and cut through the few loose ones. And you get a you know, thing like that, fold it back, and you have a nice room. I, I use big, so, juicy soil blocks, right? I use the maxi blocks or, you know, an ice cream tub, you know, big tomatoes. Um, so I want to make a nice big hole and slam a big seedling in, and then kind of have these flaps that will come and cover the tomato over. And I kind of really cut the weeds out, and I think a little bit of motion with having those flaps actually rubbed out newly germinating weeds. It's almost like having a little guy there just rubbing out. <laughs> so for something like tomatoes that you're planting, you know, one row down the bed with a lot of spacing, that seems to be worth that effort. But I didn't want to do that like for onions, right? So I found the sort of riskiest but quickest way to do it is with a flame meter, like a red dragon flame meter. Stretch the fabric out. Ideally, it would be like first thing in the morning or in the evening when it's still, there's no wind. Because you want to, I have a red dragon flame meter, which is a great tool I highly recommend for anyone. And I have the pilot valve assembly that you get from Johnny's. And I put it on, and I, I got, so I like, I do just the right sound. It's like, shh, not <laughs> but <laughs> And so it's just kind of, you have to, and it's not a lot. And you like wait. Like count and look past one, you know, wait until it's hot, and then you can go along and just go. And just make holes like super fast, like just like really, really, really fast. And if you stop, it gets too hot. And then as you go down to the um, to the plastic, if there's too much heat, it will melt a dinner plate size hole in your fabric. But once you get good at it, especially if it's been a little wet, like in the morning, a still morning after a dewy night, that will let you cut holes really, really efficiently. And um, I got to the point where I could cut like you know a whole sheet, like a hundred foot by twelve foot sheet, you know, two beds in like ten minutes. And it's like, ding, 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 ding. Um, but then sometimes if you don't have your like thing going on, you don't have your like kung fu going on, then it's just like terrible. And if it's windy, then that low setting with the pilot light will just blow out constantly. So you're just thinking, you know, quickly. And this is like one of these tiny little details that like for people who didn't grow up on a farm, like guys who like grow up on a farm know about welding. And there's this tool, it's like a striker to like start a welding torch. And like I grew up in the suburbs. I didn't really know about these things. They cost a few bucks at a painting tire. And it's just like a flint and steel that you just go click it, click and it makes a spark. And you really need one of these if you have a flame reader. So you just have one, I have it on a string tied to my flame meter backpack, and like for a few years I like use matches or lighter, and it's like so stupid, and then like I discovered there's a tool made just for this job. Yeah, it's great. Um, so that's, that's how I made the holes for the bulk of my crops. Those holes were too small for tomatoes. Um, I wasn't intending to only talk about landscape fiber for season extensions, but it's, I'm guessing we're running through a lot of our time. Oh, wow. We're in a time.
time absorption rate. I thought we were. Yes. Would those holes be okay for a smaller transplant tail? Like yes. Okay. Yes. Such as for your size. Yes, and I like the flaps. I've actually been growing tomatoes with landscape fabric for like 10 years. And I, oh, I didn't use to do the burning pole thing. The first time I tried it, I just I turned my flame meter on and like, <gasps> just went, whoa, oh, that didn't work. I just burned two foot hole of my precious fabric. So I just like never tried it again. And then once I started thinking about field scale. Now, in the current issue of Growing for Market, there's this flower farmer who's doing it. And she's wonderful. She says, don't use a flame reader. I tried it, it'll just burn big holes. And so she, her idea is she builds a template where she has cardboard with the holes, just different pieces of cardboard, and she just covers the edge of the hole with tin foil that she like tapes on. And then she uses a propane torch, like a you know, like a little butane torch, and just burns them on her hands and knees, which would certainly be more precise. I'm just like eyeballing the distances. Uh, the landscape fabric does have strips, uh, stripes every foot, so you can kind of see foot, 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 and then you kind of get the length by kind of triangulating against the lateral distance. You know, so you can kind of get a pretty good grid going. But if you're not doing a lot and you have time and you don't want to screw up, you can make a little jig out of cardboard and tin foil, or you know, apply with it or whatever, and burn it. Uh, just as an aside, growing for market is an amazing resource. Um, it's, 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 a wonderful online thing. Yes. I wonder what you have said when you do the leaf is stopped in the ground. For an extended period of time, but don't you have to try to reach your style? Yes, that's 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 like so she's asking if I am I if the right and assuming you're gonna leave this for an extended period of time. You could. I'm not planning on leaving it for more than 12 months at any one time because I want to get a cover crop in there and put compost down. Um, I've seen stuff on the internet where people in California are growing blueberries in this stuff. They're making really big mounds, like huge, like three or four feet high, almost like the profile of like half of one of those tables. And they have landscape fabric on the mound and then saw it in the path. And obviously they're planning on leaving that there for a while. Um, the one great danger of leaving it for a long time with a perennial crop is that if an organic layer builds on top of it, so you basically have mulch on top of the fabric, plants will start growing that mulch, they'll send their roots through the fabric, and now you have a mess on your hands. You can't lift up the fabric, you have a weed problem on top of the fabric, the roots kind of will push the fabric aside, and now you just have like you know, a petrochemical mess, you wish you never did landscape fabric. Some people use it. They think, oh, I'm going to keep my perennials, you know, weed free, and then I put bark mulch on top or something, and it's just a hard story. Yes? Question. I was wondering, you know, the land where I have lots of rock. Yes. Do we have to use those things before we use rock? You could use rock. Yes. No, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> I can tell you sometimes. We had, we wanted there, you spoke for the land where the biggest, and we had a way to come up that was I had a 120 foot piece set up with at least two tons of rock on it. Oh. And I was out the 90 kilometer wind zone and they had no tomato plants. I, I just blew it right off. Thing off. Yeah, I killed it all. I, I, I'll rephrase that. A guy from the suburbs of Boston has no right telling a Newfoundlander what they can and cannot do with rock. <laughs> I'm just going to back right out of that. You guys figure it out. I have no experience. I was just giving unqualified advice right there. <laughs> Terrible. I stand no, corrected. No, it was almost correct. Yeah. If you combine the rock with kids. <laughs> Pour cement on top of the landscape fabric. <laughs> um, I'm going to just shift away from landscape fabric a little bit. This is a fascinating topic, obviously. I love, I'm very interested in landscape fabric. I think it's one of the most honest uses of oil possible. Like, we're, we're like, I don't know of any or, uh, growing system except for permaculture that doesn't depend on oil. So like you, know, you got a horse farmers who are like making hay with tractors, you've got obviously tractor use, you know. And here we're just taking the oil, making a big flat, black, ugly sheet of it, and putting it right in the crop for everyone to see. 
so it's very honest. <laughs> it's very explicit and ugly and productive and oil but um, So that's Nancy Farrer. Yes. I have a very short question. What do you use in trans? Do you use soil blocks for onions as well? Yes. You're using uh, like a half field transplant or something? I didn't. I don't own one. Um, direct seeded greens have really been my bread and butter. So like this year, I only planted a test crop. And when I used to do a lot of transplanted stuff, hot fields didn't exist. And obviously, a mechanical transplanter would work. Um, I think soil block, landscape fabric, you know, kind of thing, is a pretty logical scale if you're growing a small amount of onions. I think if I was to sort of scale up, like to where you are, I wouldn't really think it would be worth it. Like if I was you with what you have, the land and the equipment you have, I don't think I'd bother with landscape fabric onions. Like if I had a triple row cultivation system, I think I'd use that. Um, I don't think this would beat it in uh, you know, production per hour. And you have to buy the fabric and everything, but if you don't have an awesome cultivating tractor, this is a boom. Yes? I was just going to add, we tried using the half transplanter with soil rocks and a tip halfway down and jam. So we ended up doing everything by hand, anyway, because we're shoving. I just wanted to do that and suggest that hole, like, making the hole in the soil cooler just amending the hole. Right. I mean, honestly, I'm pretty new at all this plastic on the ground stuff. Um, most of my farming life, I've been very just kind of, you know, Compost, manure spreader, spread it, plow it, disc it up, do everything just very standard. So, this is all new territory for me, and I can't really speak to that. Yeah. I'm very interested in mechanical transplanting on a small scale. I think that's an area that has a lot of potential, and I'd like to see someone do something like that. The other thing we were experimenting with was doing a row of black plastic and then a row of not experience that this year. <laughs> you just really have to take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt because it was such an unusual year. Um, you know, the, the part of tomatoes doing awesome this year, basically no disease and huge yields, is an interesting data point. You know, when you see that field of black plastic, I mean, it's just ugly and sin. And, you know, I, I can totally imagine it being just an oven. Um, Okay, we went really far into landscape fabric. Are there any other questions or comments about landscape fabric? Yeah? Okay. Um, kind of like to just, are there anything that people have to, is there anything kind of on people's minds about season extension? Yes. Uh, you said you used something similar to a caterpillar tunnel in the past. Could yeah. You talk a little bit about your experience there? Sure. You know, it's funny. I. Can you go actually back to the first slide? Just, just keep going back. I'm really, I almost feel like caterpillar tunnels are a, a valid discussion topic in a non greenhouse lecture. Because this, this looks a lot like a greenhouse, but practically, considering the expense of it and the time it takes to build it, it's sort of in a different class. Um, and this is actually, this is up right now. <laughs> it's going to be very interesting to see what's up after yesterday's win. Um, the story with this is that, you know, it's like, we all know it's so hard to make a living farming. And we all come to different conclusions of how to get that season extension to work, bang for your buck. And it sort of seems like greenhouses are getting more like, more light and easy to build and cheap. And I think a great example of that is like the Haygrove Tunnel. And like Rupert wrote a great article in the Cog a while back about his experience with the uh, Haygrove Solo. Does everyone know what a Haygrove is? It's, like a, um, it's from Britain. 
but it's basically a, an adaptation of Spanish style greenhouses, which are very lightweight. They have each, um, they're usually gutter connect, right? So you have you know, a wall on either side and a bay after bay after bay touching each other. And the thing about Spanish style is it has ropes that are crisscrossing. And actually, this was taken as I was putting it up. Jen took a picture of this ropes going this way, but then there was going to be ropes going that way. So you have crisscrossing ropes that are cinched really tight, holding the plastic down on the frame. And hay groves work on that principle. So I, I mentioned hay groves just because a lot of people have seen them. There's uh, quite a few hay groves in Annapolis Valley, or some hay groves in Annapolis Valley. They're not designed to take a solo. And um, so this greenhouse here is a very elegant example of a Spanish style greenhouse. And, uh, and Johnny's Seeds is also selling a version of Spanish style. As I said at the beginning of the year. This greenhouse. I think I'd, I'd like to talk about this in about a year when I know more about it, but I kind of want to mention it now in case anyone wants to play around with it. Um, because it would be really great if lots of people are experimenting with it. But this has over um, sort of the cheapest and most efficient real greenhouse, which I'd say the sort of the edge of that would be like the hay grow solo that Rupert grows so many beautiful tomatoes in. So Rupert has a, is it 32 feet by 100 or something like that? 28 by 200. 20 by 200. Okay, so he has this huge, beautiful tunnel that you uncover every winter, right? I'll uncover it next week before the first snow. Right. So it doesn't take a snow. <laughs> you can drive a tractor <laughs> through it. It's very inexpensive, but it's stationary, right? Yes. You, can, you could move it. If you put the additional anchors down, they wouldn't be difficult to move. So it's kind of like, you see how like that's a greenhouse almost becoming a field tunnel? And then you have field tunnels almost becoming greenhouses. And right where those two things overlap, I think there's a lot of really interesting design possibilities. So this is a field tunnel that's like almost looking like a greenhouse. And I'm just going to quickly describe how this is built in case anyone wants to check it out. Um, it's uh, hoops on six foot centers. There are uh, 24 foot pieces of um, one eighth wall or Yes, yeah, so they've got one eighth wall square stock tubing from uh, Russell Metals here in the Industrial Park of Trackman. They cost 28 bucks each. I bent them with a homemade bending jig, which I should have brought a picture of, because you can see a picture of it online if you Google search Hanley Hoop Houses, Todd Hanley. You can bend them really easily with a jig. A friend of mine welded up for 30 bucks. It's about 80 bucks materials. Um, I take 24 inch pieces of uh, 5 8 or 15 millimeter rebar, have them in the ground, slip the hoops onto the rebar, attach some spring clips with wire or rope on the rebar that the, the pipe goes over the rope so it can't slip up. And I just clip the rope onto it, cover it in plastic. You can build one of these in like an hour. It's so mobile. Like you can build one of these, put over a crop in the spring, once that crop is up and going, you can take it down and put it over your tomatoes. You know, plant spinach next to the tomatoes. When the tomatoes poop out this time of year, move on to the spinach. So it's, I'd say it's more mobile than an Elliott Coleman greenhouse per labor unit. It's really mobile. And now my trick is making it not mobile in the wind, right? So I'm still trying to get it robust enough. And it's really cheap. Um, there's no wiggle wire on it. There's four T-posts at the ends, you can't quite see the ends here, but right about here, there's two T-posts with the plastic wrapped sort of into a ponytail and cinched down. And you can see that all, if you go to Johnny's Selected Seed website, and you go to their high tunnel vendor manual, which is hard to find on the site, you might actually have to call them up and help you find them. I found it by accident, and then tried to find out how I found it, and couldn't find it again. Yeah, you could just catch them. It's a really nicely done manual, but it has a lot of design information. And it's interesting though, because their high tunnel is really built like a light greenhouse. And what I mean by that is they're using chain link top rail, and they're anchoring it with very heavy, uh, larger chain link stuff. It's expensive, it's permanent, it wouldn't be easy to move. It's a little more sturdy than this design probably, because I can blow it away in the wind so likely. But it's really a greenhouse pretending to be a high tunnel, not a high tunnel pretending to be a greenhouse. 
And I don't know if I'm losing you guys here, but yes, Ken. Um, I had a couple of things. First, point, first, I guess, point. I was at Turnsall uh, Cooperative Farm last week in uh, Montreal, and they have something similar. And they were having some wind issues as well, and they actually put a plastic piece of wiggle wire track every hundred feet. They have a three hundred foot tunnel, so they put a one on every hundred feet. And they put wiggle wire in and hold it to the loop every every hundred feet. Uh, and they were quite happy with that. The second question I have is, yeah. was the, uh, the square tubing used, the rectangular tubing used, was that galvanized or was that? Uh, it should be galvanized. Uh, Todd Hanley's using galvanized that he can get in Dallas, Texas. Um, to get galvanized square tubing, cheap, it's just so expensive here. I, I had to buy the ungalvanized and then get it galvanized myself yeah. in Dartmouth, and it would have been like way more expensive than metal. I built greenhouses like this 10 years ago. I built some that I'm still using. That picture where the corn um, was planted in the landscape park for the next slide, there was that greenhouse in it. I don't know if you guys saw that. That's a, mo a modification of this that I came up with myself that has perloids made out of rebar and it's kind of more like a high tunnel pretending to be a greenhouse. But the hoops are the same thing and now they're 10 years old. They're a little bit rusty, but they're not, um, they're not significantly corroding the strain, and they're not ruining the plastic either. So that was, so, that was the galvanized? Ungalvanized, yeah. Is that right? And I, I think it's the kind of thing where, like, if galvanization costs, galvanizing, costs, let's say, 30 bucks each, and you're going to get 15 years out of it without galvanizing it, you know, so if you have 30 bucks each times how many hoops you're going to buy, you know, you put that in an RSP, 15 years later you're going to get ahead. You know, it's just, it's just you maybe for any logical reason you want to not have your model rest on you yet. Maybe if you live near a bigger population center, you could find a thousand tubes. I couldn't complex. Yes? You're not keeping this up. You're just... No. Yeah. So this is, this is where, uh, some help with that question. The Johnny's design has the pony, the, the caterpillar, which is you know where it's pulled back to the end like that. And the Hanley house has wiggle wire all along the arch. The reason I wanted that Johnny style caterpillar thing is I want to be able to wait for that first snow and then just push the powder with plastic right up and over and all the way over to the side.